Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I, um, uh, so today we're here to listen to Professor Simon on the story of annuals. Um, I, it's our sixth, fifth part of the term, and I'm very happy to see so many of you here. I'm sorry for the confusion of the lecture theater. The door closes at 6.30, so some, you have to be inside to open it. And uh, but I'm really looking forward to this talk, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to see the blackboard because it's entirely a blackboard talk. But if you want, you can shift the word. Uh, anyway, um, so Professor Simon is a condensed matter theorist at the University of Oxford and a fellow at Solon College at Oxford. Um, his work mostly focuses on topological phases of matter, but he also works on topological phases of computing and dynamic theory. Um, thank you very much. Seth is also uh, director of the Bell Laboratory in the early 2000s and uh, has authored a book on solid state physics and the author of solid state basics. So, without further ado, I hand over to Professor. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's a pleasure to be here at, at the other university. Um, the, the story I'm I'm going to tell the story of anions is is asking a question of what happens when you have identical particles in quantum physics. This is a rather old question. It's about hundred years old, and the reason I'm telling it to you now is because there's been some very important experimental progress just in the last few years, and I want to lead up to that. So our story starts in 1924 with a a man in uh, India, uh, Satyendra Bose, who sends a letter to Albert Einstein. And the letter reads, I have it here, respected sir, I have ventured to send you the accompanying article. And he goes on to ask Einstein to help him get this paper published in Zeitschrift for Physique, which was the leading physics journal in the 1920s. He goes on and says, though a complete stranger to you, I do not feel any hesitation in making this request. What Bose had done is he had derived Max Planck's radiation law, black body radiation law, the, the amount of uh, radiation, the power of radiation emitted from a black body at a given temperature from first principles. Now this radiation law was known. There were some hand-waving arguments about where it must come from, but no one had actually derived it. And the way he managed to do it is by treating the photons, the particles of light as being indistinguishable in a certain way. Einstein realized immediately that this, Einstein was very famous by that time already, and he probably received a lot of, of junk mail. It was before the age of, of email, but there was still junk. Um, he realized immediately that this was uh, not only correct and important, but that it could be generalized to particles that have mass, unlike photons, which do not have, have mass. And the type of particles that they were describing is now known as bosons. Now, the very next year, 1925, um, Wolfgang Pauli pointed out or formulated a statement that electrons behave completely differently. He formulated his famous Pauli exclusion principle, which says that you cannot put two electrons in the same, in the same state, unlike the case of photons, where you can put many photons in the, in the same state. Now, once he had stated this principle, it became uh, obvious what to do next. We have to follow the same subscription of Bose, but changing the rules such that you can only put one uh, particle in a state. And this gives us what's known as Fermi-Dirac statistics, which was formulated first by neither Fermi nor Dirac. It was actually formulated first by Jordan. Um, this is an example of, of Stiegler's law that nothing is named after the person who first discovered it. Stiegler's law was, was discovered by Merton, um, hence proving the law. Anyway. The Fermi Dirac statistics was discovered uh, first by Jordan. And the reason it's not named after Jordan is a bit of a historical accent. So Jordan writes this down very quickly, learning of Pauli's exclusion principle. He realizes what he has to do. He derives what we now call the Fermi Dirac distribution, and he sends it off to a journal. The journal sends it to a reviewer who we now know is Max Born. Max Born is um, a rather forget, he's very brilliant, later Nobel laureate. Um, but he's also a very forgetful guy. He's also the grandfather of the rock singer, Olivia Newton-John, who passed away earlier this year. Very good rock singer, one of my favorites, but um, that's a little bit irrelevant. But anyway, he is a forgetful guy. He takes his 
um, this paper with the best intention to read it, and he sticks it in, in his suitcase and forgets about it. And about a year and a half later, he opens up his suitcase, sees the papers, and he realizes that this result that Jordan had, had uh, submitted to the journal had actually been published within that year and a half by Fermi and Dirac, and it got named after Fermi and Dirac rather than after Jordan, who was actually got to the result first. Now, the physics community and the scientific community in general is usually pretty good at correcting errors of attribution if we later found out that Jordan had derived this result first. Under normal circumstances, what we would do is we would rename uh, it Jordan Fermi Dirac statistics or Fermi Dirac Jordan statistics or something like that. But in this case, that never happened. And there's a good reason why it never happened. Uh, very shortly after 1925, Jordan became a very prominent Nazi and no one liked him at all and no one felt the need to do him any, any favors. Um, later in, uh, um, in life, Max Born said that he, he did feel terribly guilty about this mistake, although he very much disagreed with all of Jordan's politics. He um, said he still felt bad that he deprived Jordan of this credit that he rightly deserved. Uh, a lot of people believe that Jordan was probably entitled to a Nobel Prize Ironically, a Nobel Prize should have been awarded with Max Born, um, except for his political beliefs, which made everyone hate him. So there's, there's an important moral to this story, um, which is don't be a Nazi. Um, so anyway, so Fermi Dirac statistics, or what sometimes we call uh, these particles fermions, the electron being a, a perfectly good example of this. By, um, by 1930, the laws of quantum mechanics were pretty much finalized. If you want to include quantum field theory, the laws were pretty much finalized by the late 1940s. And you might ask, well, between 1930 and much later, 50 years later, didn't people ask if you could have other particles besides bosons or fermions? And the answer to that appeared to be no. And there's an, there's an argument that's given in most quantum mechanics textbooks, almost every quantum mechanics textbook, which seems fairly convincing. And, and the art, argument goes kind of like this. You have a, a wave function for say two particles. You can have more particles if you like, but let's just take two. Um, the square of this wave function gives you the probability of finding one particle at position one and another particle at position two. And the, part, and the particles are assumed to be identical. Then you define an operator called the exchange operator, E hat equals exchange, which switches the positions of R1 and R2. R1 goes to R2, like this. Now, if you square this operator, E hat squared, well, if you exchange the particles once and you exchange them again, you get back to where you started. So E squared has to equal one. And that means that E hat can only be plus or minus one, since there's only two square roots of of one, and if you have, have plus one, it's the case of bosons, and if you have minus one, it's the case of, of fermions. Now, it, one thing that I, sh I should just mention, if it's not obvious already, if it's the case, if it's minus one for fermions, Fermi, for the Fermi case, uh, psi of R1, R1, well, R1, R2 equals minus psi of R2, R1, and that means psi of R1, R1 has to equal zero, anti-symmetric function, and its origin must, must equal zero. Um, so that means that there's zero probability of finding, or zero amplitude of finding two particles, which are fermions, at the same position, at the same time. This is the Pauli exclusion principle in action. You cannot put two electrons or any two fermions, uh, identical fermions, at the same position. Okay, now this argument, it seems like a very good argument. It's on in all the quantum mechanics textbooks. Simple, convincing, and not really right. Um, so people believe this argument for a long time. And it was 1977 when someone first pointed out that there's a problem with it. So a rather breakthrough important paper by two people. Um, I'm probably going to spell this wrong. So let me uh, do him justice and spell his name right. Um, Jan Magna Linus. Lyonas with two A's, and Jan Merheim, um, both of them in Oslo. Um, you might extrapolate from this and, and conclude that everyone in Oslo is named Jan, 
I, I checked, it's not true, not everyone in Oslo. It is the most common name in Oslo, but followed closely there behind by Per and Bjorn. So it, it is just luck that, that they're both named Jan and they're from Oslo. Anyway, so what they pointed out, I'll write this down even because it's, uh, it's an important statement, that in two plus one dimensions, and, and if it's, you haven't seen that notation before, when we say plus one, we mean plus time. So two spatial dimensions, plus one time dimension. So we're thinking about things living on a flat surfaces. You can have other particles, can have other things, have other things besides just, uh, besides bosons and fermions, not bosons and fermions, besides bosons and fermions. Bose and fermions. So this rather important paper was um, was kind of cute, completely ignored for a while. Um, but the, the thing that they they claimed would was possible is that you have here's our two dimensional system, and you have two identical particles in it. And if you exchange the particles counterclockwise, the wave function picks up some phase theta. Where is if you here's the same picture again. If I exchange the particles clockwise, you pick up a phase even minus i theta. And what's kind of crucial in saying that this is a, a statistical property of the particles, like exchanging the two particles if they're bosons and fermions, is that the phase you get should be independent of the detailed path that you take. It should just matter whether you exchange them clockwise or you exchange them counterclockwise, but not exactly how you how you did it. So what went wrong in the books? Um, the books and the conventional argument, what's wrong with them? Let me see if I can uh, draw this and make it a little bit more, more obvious what went wrong. Uh, I need to lift weights apparently to use this chalkboard. Okay, so I'm going to draw some space-time diagrams. Um, so time is gonna go vertically like this. Time goes up because time is money and money goes up unless it's pounds and pounds go down. But um, so we laugh, but you know, it's gallows humor. We, unless, unless you're from another country and you're, you hold your savings in dollars or Swiss francs or something, then, then you can laugh at the rest of us. Okay, anyway, so we have two particles and um, we're going to exchange them, say, counterclockwise like this, so that I'm drawing world lines of the particles as we go through time, moving back to the same position, then I'm going to exchange them uh, counterclockwise again, like this. And if you get rid of these planes that I drew, so two-dimensional planes, you'll realize what I've done is I've braided the particles around each other like this. And that is not equal to something that looks like this, which would be to have not exchanged the particles at all. This, if I had done um, something different over here, where I exchange the particles clockwise, then counterclockwise, the opposite order, this thing can be straightened out to kind of look like this. And that can be deformed into this continuously, but not into this if I keep the endpoints fixed. Is that clear? Okay. So the moral of this, of this picture here is that two exchanges e hat squared in two dimensions does not have to equal, in two plus one dimensions, exchange squared does not have to equal one. You have to say a little bit more about how you exchange the particles. Did you exchange them clockwise or did you exchange them counterclockwise? And if you have more particles, you have to you know, say even more about what you did to give a detailed picture of, of what happened. Now, um, so that's what went wrong with the argument. And you might say, well, wait a second, couldn't you make the same argument in three dimensions, uh, three plus one dimensions? So let's think about this. Um, it turns out that in three plus one dimensions, uh, okay, did I write this down? Okay, okay, in two, this is in two plus one D. Two plus one D exchange squared is not equal to one, but in three plus one D, uh, exchange squared does equal one. And this comes from a simple topological statement, which is that uh, there are no knots 
in world lines, world lines living in 4D total. Okay. Now, this may this statement may seem completely obtuse to you if you've never thought about it before. If you've thought about it before, it's completely obvious. But let me try to make it obvious to everyone whether or not you've thought about it before. So, so backing up in two plus one dimensions here, the reason that we have exchange squared not equals one is because we can make knots in the world lines as, as I've done here. But in three plus one, I claim you can't have knots in the world lines. Now, despite my fantastic uh, artistic ability, I still cannot draw things in four dimensions. So we're going to have to argue by lower dimensional analogy. See if we can do this. Um, let's imagine we have, so let's start with one plus one dimension. We'll have a line. That's our one, one dimension. And we're going to imagine putting two particles, they may be distinguishable or not distinguishable, uh, on a line, on the straight line like this, okay? Now what I'd like to do, here's the game. I would like to take these particles towards each other and pass them through each other, okay? Get them to the other side, get them to the opposite side. And I would like to do this without them touching each other. Is that possible? No, it's not possible. They will always crash. They must crash, okay? But now I'm gonna change the rules of the game a little bit. So I'm gonna change the rules of the game I'm gonna say, no, it's not two, one plus one dimensional problem. It's a two plus one dimensional problem. And I'd like to start with the particles on a line. And I'd like to take them past each other without them touching each other. Can I do that? Yes, I can. I can just move this guy a little bit off into the additional direction, move it over, and I bring it back down on the other side. And they don't have to crash, no crash, okay? So far, so good. Yeah, okay, now let's move up uh, to the problem we actually wanna think about. So in two plus one dimensions, now we're gonna think about world lines of particles and we'll imagine we have two world lines that cross over each other like this, an overcrossing. So we'll fix the endpoints here and the endpoints here and we have an overcrossing of this line over that line. And I would like to take that overcrossing and I'd like to pass the overcrossing, uh, pass this line through this line without them touching each other. Is that possible? No, they always crash. There's a statement that in two plus one dimensions, you can have knots. Good? Everyone happy? Okay, but if I have three plus one dimensions, I have an overcrossing like this, and I may fix the endpoints, and I want to take them through each other, can I do it? Yes, I can. I just um, displace this little piece of the string into the additional dimension, just like I did here. And then I can pass it through and reconstitute it on the opposite side until it looks like this and they never touch each other. Okay, is that clear? Yes? You should stop and ask questions if, if, if it's not clear. Everyone happy with that statement? Okay, so the point is that you can continuously turn an overcrossing into an undercrossing if the lines live in three plus one dimensions. That means there's, you can't have a knot, which means the two exchanges, you know, the, the world lines can never get knotted up. Two exchanges can only be the identity. So the argument in all the textbooks that you can only have bosons and fermions is correct in three plus one dimensions, but it's not correct in two plus one dimensions. Good? All right, right. So as I mentioned, this important breakthrough result from 1977 was uh, completely ignored for some number of years. Um, it was re-derived uh, independently in, in 81 by Golden, Menikoff, and Sharp, uh, a bunch of uh, mathematicians. Lev Landau had a uh, expression for this that he liked to use. He used to say it was, it was derived, yes, it was derived independently, independently, but later meaning you don't get credit if you didn't look in, you know, you should have looked in the literature and noticed it had been done, been done before. Um, but they didn't notice it had been done before. They derived it independently. I'm not going to say it doesn't get any credit because they actually did something in addition that was interesting. The method they used was more generalizable than the method from uh, uh, that Nason and Merheim used. The method that they used was actually based on a field theoretical method uh, cooked up by Laidlaw and DeWitt so DeWitt was a very interesting person, uh, Cecile Moret DeWitt, 
Um, she was a, a very good field theorist, grew up during the war. A lot of her family was killed during the war, um, but she went on to, to work with uh, Joliet Curies and then with Schrodinger and then with Oppenheimer. Um, by 71, she was already quite well known and she was interested in 71. This is when the method was cooked up. Um, she was interested in this question of why do you only have bosons and fermions? And she goes through the derivation and she uses field theory to show that you only get bosons and fermions. And she notes, actually, this method does not work in two plus one dimensions. Something must be different there. But then she stops. That she didn't carry it on and see what can you have in two plus one dimensions. But it's clear she understood why it was not going to work in two plus one dimensions and stop there. So she almost gets credit, but not, not, not quite. Um, OK, so both of these papers were completely ignored um, until 82, um, when it was picked up by a Frank Wilczek. So Frank Wilczek, um, the later Nobel laureate, he won his Nobel Prize for work on uh, asymptotic freedom, the quark model. Um, he was only the fifth citation of this Linnaeus and Murheim paper, and I believe uh, the first four were by Linnaeus and Murheim themselves. So he was really the only person who noticed what had happened here and also noticed why it was interesting and, and important. He also coined the word anion for this kind of particle. Maybe I'll, well, okay, I'll write it down here. Anion, which means anything other than bosons and fermions, okay? Um, all right. Um, so here we are in 1982. Wilczek had finally taken an interest in this. A lot of people following what Wil Wilczek was already very famous. Um, a lot of people taking interest in what Wilczek was doing. So it becomes a popular subject. And then we have a historical, another historical accident, which is that 1982 was also the experimental discovery of what we call fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, fractional quantum Hall. Which resulted in a Nobel Prize for its discoverers, uh, Sui Stormer and Goss. Actually, two of its discoverers, Sui and Stormer, later won a Nobel Prize for it. The third discoverer, Gossard, actually did not. There's a long, complicated story about why that is, but ne never mind. Um, the next year, there was um, uh, the theory of fractional quantum Hall effect by, by Bob Laughlin. He also won a Nobel Prize along with Sui and Stormer. The following year, so this is uh, theory a fractional quantum Hall effect. Why am I telling you about fractional quantum Hall effect? I'll tell you in a moment while I'll give you a hint. This is an effect that occurs in two dimensions, two plus one dimensions, two plus one D. Um, so the theory of fractional quantum Hall effect was worked out by Bob Laughlin in 83. He wins a Nobel Prize for it much later in 1998. In 84, there were two teams thinking about this, this problem. The first is, is Bert Halpern. Um, Full disclosure, he's my thesis advisor, um, but much later than that, I'm, I'm not that old. The, uh, and the other team is Aravas, Sharifer, and Wilczek. Um, so Sharifer is a name that people should also know. He's a Nobel laureate for his work on superconductivity. Wilczek, later Nobel laureate for his work on the quark miles. Aravas, the poor graduate student who did all the work. Um, you'll find that more entertaining when you're a graduate student, I think. Anyway. Um, <laughs> or maybe less entertaining. Anyway, so what these groups did the following year in 1984 is they came to a rather remarkable conclusion that fractional quantum Hall effect, an effect that occurs in, in two-dimensional electron systems at low temperature, the low energy excitations, low energy excitations or particles, particles are anions. So theoretically they showed that these anions, these particles that behave like that, this, that accumulate a fractional phase, some arbitrary phase when you move them around each other clockwise and an opposite phase if you move them around each other counterclockwise, um, that they actually exist in, in fractional quantum Hall systems. So this became part of the condensed matter lexicon, part of the, you know, what you learn about in, in when you learn condensed matter theory or condensed matter physics. It, um, was accepted almost immediately by pretty much the entire community, but it took a very long time before someone could do that experiment that I erased over here, which is you take two particles, you drag them around each other and you measure 
the phase that you accumulate and you show that it's not plus one and it's not minus one, the phase is some fractional phase and it's independent of path and so forth. So that took a long time, that took till 2020. And this is the new, new progress of actually being able to measure that phase. And what's kind of interesting is it was not measured in just one experiment, it was measured in several different experiments using different techniques, but it was a long time getting from 1984 to 2020. So why do we care so much about, about anions? Why do we care? Um, well, maybe I'll just, I'll just state this instead of writing it down. So first, uh, anions are, are, are something that are of fundamental interest. We, especially as a condensed matter theorist, we like to ask what kind of matter can exist, what kind of particles can exist, and if it does exist, what are its properties? So that's uh, you know, a fundamental question. We actually believe that um, anions may exist in lots of physical systems besides just fractional quantum Hall effect. There's quantum Hall effects, spin liquids, superfluids, various other um, systems which don't actually have simple names, Majorana systems. Anyway, there's lots and lots of, of other places where we believe these things exist. So that's one uh, reason why we care. Another reason why we care is something that came out only in the 1990s uh, due to a, a very a number of very brilliant people, Xiaogan Wen and Alexei Kateyev. Um, well, you know, some people are, are super geniuses. Those are, those are two of the super geniuses. Um, what they realized is that if you have an anion system in your pocket or at your disposal, it actually works very well as a quantum memory. And what's a quantum memory? If you think about, you know, your, the computer on your desk, it has a memory where it stores information and it has a processor which manipulates that information and does some operations on it. If you want to build a quantum computer, you need some place to put your quantum information, your qubits, and you need to manipulate the qubits. An anion system works very well as a quantum memory, and that was realized in 1997. The following year, um, Kateyev and, and Michael Friedman, Michael Friedman is a Fields medalist, um, that's the highest prize in mathematics, for his work on the Poincaré conjecture in the, in, the, in the 1980s. Did everyone see the news article about the Riemann hypothesis today? Did you see that? Anyone believe it? No, I don't know. It's, uh, it's anyway. Okay, this is totally off topic. Anyway, so Friedman um, is a Fields medalist um, for his work on the Poincaré conjecture. And it's also, coincidentally, um, the same year he won the Fields medal, he also won the United States Rock Climbing Championship. Kind of hard guy to keep up with. Um, so, um, but th what they realized was that there are certain types of particles called non-abelian anions, which is a little bit of a generalization of what I described to you, which not only work as quantum memories, but also work as quantum computers, so that you can actually do computations by dragging particles around each other in certain patterns. So this idea of building a quantum computer by, by finding a physical system like fractional quantum Hall effect, where you can drag particles around each other in certain patterns to do quantum computations, known as topological quantum computation, was a very appealing idea to a lot of people. And in particular, the corporation Microsoft invested a lot of money into try to, trying to develop this into a, a real technology. As of, of this time, I mean, I don't have access to their books, but my estimate just by knowing how many people work for them and how much they're probably getting paid is that they're, um, they've easily spent $100 million on trying to build a quantum computer out of this type of uh, anion physics. Um, there's another question as to whether this is actually working, um, which is a different story. But okay, so um, those are some of the reasons why we're interested in, in anions. Um, and then, as I said, in 2020, we managed to, we as a community, managed to show this, um, this fractional phase that you get for braiding particles around each other in these fractional, in, in these anion systems. There were three separate experiments that showed this. One is um, known as the anion collider experiment, which was done by uh, Gwendal Feves group in France, uh, 2020. Uh, the anion interferometer experiment done by a group at Purdue, Mike Manfred's group, also in 2020. And then there's uh, the, 
well, okay, a quantum simulation of an anion system done by Google. It was actually a very similar experiment. It was done by the Chinese group um, and also by a group in, in, in Switzerland. But the Google experiment was um, a little bit nicer than, than the others, but it was, uh, strictly speaking, done by another number of groups, sort of roughly the same, same time. So why did it take, I should actually say, to, to be a little bit more, more uh, precise, the first two experiments, the anion collider experiment and the anion interferometer experiment, were both done in fractional quantum Hall systems, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit about fractional quantum Hall effect in, in a moment. The quantum processor experiment is simulation of matter using a elementary quantum computer. This is a, um, a little bit of a, I don't wanna say it's a cheat, um, but there's a slight difference between simulating matter and actually having matter. Uh, but there's a very fuzzy line between, you know, where you draw the distinction between the two. So we'll put that in, in its own category and maybe not discuss it. But, um, you know, you could include it on the list or not include it on the list, depending on how you're, you're feeling. Okay, so this is the history of the story. Let me start over. If we're going to, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to describe to you the anion interferometer experiment, which is probably the easiest to, to describe. And it probably, well, of the two that were done in fractional quantum Hall systems, it's the um, probably the clearer of the two experiments. So I'm going to describe that to you. I'm happy to talk about the other one if there's enough time. But first, what we have to do is we have to say something about fractional quantum Hall effect. So what is fractional quantum Hall effect? FQHE, um, well, that's its abbreviation, fractional quantum Hall effect. So first what you need is you need uh, two-dimensional electrons. So you need two electrons confined to a two-dimensional plane. Um, so there's many ways that you might be able to confine electrons to a two-dimensional plane. These experiments were actually done in a semiconductor quantum wells, where you produce a semiconductor layer by layer, and you um, make a, a very, very thin sandwich to hold electrons between a, you know, layers of other semiconductors. So the electrons are running around in this two-dimensional layers. And this is how fractional quantum Hall effect experiments have been done since, since the 1980s. However, in the modern era, there's another method for making two-dimensional electrons, which seems to be just as good, maybe even better. And, and maybe these experiments will be done soon in, in these other systems as well. It's known as the scotch tape method, um, where you, you take some material like graphite, you stick a piece of scotch tape on it, and you peel off a single layer of atoms and you move it over here and you do the experiment on the single layer of atoms. The fact that this works is, is insane, but apparently it does. And I've also been told it's not actually scotch tape you use, it's a different brand that, that works, but whatever. Um, so, so you can make things like graphene, which is a single layer of carbon, and you can do these experiments on, on single layer, layer carbon or double layer carbon, um, but something where the electrons are, are very well confined to a single atomic two-dimensional layer. So you take your two-dimensional electrons, and it, I should also mention that in order to see fractional quantum Hall effect, your two-dimensional electrons have to be very clean. If there's any disorder, you know, any dust or, or anything else in the, in, the, in the sample, nothing works. So it has to be in, in insanely clean, but that's a technology that people have gotten good at. And you add a magnetic field. So you add a B field as well. And then you cool the thing down, cool, to low temperature. Um, and by low temperature, I mean on the order of, of 10 millikelvin. So we live at on the order of 300 Kelvin, and now we're down at 10 millikelvin above absolute zero. So it's a pretty hard experiment to do. And if you do this right, out comes fractional quantum Hall effect. And so the electrons in your two-dimensional um, system become a very special state of matter called fractional quantum Hall effect. Now, it's not just a single effect. There's several different effects um, labeled by a number we often call nu, which is the electron density um, uh, times a, um, well, uh, something with units, H over EH is Planck's constant, E is the charge of an electron divided by magnetic field. 
if you calculate this, you will realize that this, this combination is dimensionless. When this thing is approximately equal to a small integer ratio P over Q, you get a fractional quantum Hall state. The one we're going to be concerned with is nu equals one over three, um, which was the first fractional quantum Hall state measured in experiment. It's actually the easiest to produce an experiment and it is the most stable. And that's why they do experiments on the nu equals one third fractional quantum Hall state. All right, so what are the properties of this nu equals one third fractional quantum Hall state? First of all, I should say that doing any sort of measurement at 10 millikelvin um, is very hard. Um, but there are some experiments that you can do. And one experiment that you can do is you take your sample, it's some arbitrary shape, and you attach a leads to it, electrical leads, and you run current through the sample over here and you measure voltage over here. So it's a conductance measurement, a four point conductance measurement. And if you do the experiment like this, you get voltage equals zero. Um, sort of interesting. What that's telling you, remember that power dissipated is current times voltage. There's no voltage, so there's no power dissipation. That means there's no loss, there's no friction, no viscosity. The um, current is flowing without any loss. This is some sort of superfluid. Okay, so that's an interesting experiment. There's another experiment that you can do, which is very similar to this. And the only thing you change is you switch how the leads are connected. So like this, okay? So again, you're running current, but now the current is between here and here and the voltage is between here and here. This is a Hall effect experiment. Um, the Hall voltage is H over E squared. So again, Planck's constant divided by the charge in the next one squared. And then Q over P, well, in this case, Q over P is gonna be three. So, because Q is three and P is, one, three times the current, I. So the resistance, the Hall resistance that you're measuring is ex exactly three times these fundamental constants H over E squared. And this is what gives um, the fractional quantum Hall effect the name quantized because this ratio is quantized in units of H over E squared, fundamental constants, Planck's constants and the charge on the electron. How well is it quantized? It's basically quantized as well as you can possibly measure it. Um, it has been demonstrated to be quantized to one part in 10 to the 10 and higher precision than one part in 10 to the 10. You basically just can't measure anything that more precisely at this point. Um, it's an incredible effect. Um, and then you say, well, why, why is it so incredible to have it quantized like this? If you think about measuring resistance in a piece of copper, um, the result you get out depends entirely on how you attach the leads, where you attach the leads. If there's any disorder in the sample, it will change the result. But in this experiment, none of that matters. You always get the same result, entirely the same, okay? So it's kind of, kind of interesting. All right, so where are the anions? Well, keep in mind that this is some sort of superfluid. That means currents flow without any loss and they will continue to flow forever. Um, and if you create, if you stir the system such that you get vortices, these vortices are persistent. They will last forever. They actually pick up charges, but that's, we'll come to that in a moment. So you can have vortices and anti-vortices and these vortices will last in your system forever. These are the low energy excitations of the quantum Hall fluid. These are sometimes known as quasi-particles. Um, quasi-particles. And the quasi-particles have a number of rather interesting properties. Um, first of all, the electric charge, uh, charge of these quasi-particles is plus or minus E over three. It's kind of interesting. You have particles with a fraction of the charge of an electron. That should be a little surprising to us since we, what we put into the system was electrons with charge E and we're getting out of the system charges, which are a fraction of an electron. This has been measured very explicitly in, in the experiments by a number of techniques by this time, the first time in, in 1996, by using shot noise uh, experiments where you, you run current through, this, through the sample and you see that your current arrives in units of, of E over, over three. So how could it be that you, you're getting these particles with only the fraction of a charge 
of an electron. Well, the way we should think about it is that you have some sort of soup of electrons, which is completely uniform in charge. The electrons are spread out, their wave function is spread out completely, but these defects in the soup, these vortices in the soup are the things that have the fractional charge, okay? Good, everyone sort of happy with that? I'm not too unhappy. Okay, the thing that we're gonna be interested in is that when we exchange two of these particles, the, you pick up a phase e to the two pi i over three. They are anions, okay? Now, those skeptics in the audience and maybe people who, who have a tendency to like things like high energy physics might say, well, are these real particles? Are these fundamental particles or are they not fundamental particles? They, they exist only in this two-dimensional plane. So why should I think of these as being real fundamental particles? So now I can start on my, my usual rant about what you call as fundamental. What you call something fundamental depends entirely on the energy scale where you are probing it. We like to think of protons as being fundamental particles, but we know if you go to LHC, you can break up a pro proton into quarks. And you say, oh, the quarks are fundamental. Maybe at some other energy scale, you can break up the quarks as well. And then you would say something else is fundamental. In this case, it's actually, it's a little strange because the thing that you put in has charge E, but the low energy excitations, the thing that you can probe at the energy scale that's available at this temperature actually has charge E over three. If you were a little being living in this two-dimensional plane and you were doing experiments in this, in this system, you would not know that there were particles making up your system of charge E. The only thing you would be able to probe at low energy is the particles with charge E over three. And you would say, ah, my universe is made of particles of charge E over three, okay? And it could be the same for us as well. We like to think of electron as being fundamental, but the fun, you know, fundamental particle at some other energy scale could either have greater charge or could have lesser charge. It's not always breaking it up. It could emerge and be smaller, uh, you know, and, and be larger or smaller. And it's always just a question of what is the effective theory at the energy scale that you are measuring, okay? End rant, okay. So we need um, to know a couple things to describe. Oh boy, I'm running out of time, aren't I? Well, I should be able to do it anyway. Okay, here we go. To describe this experiment, the anion interferometer experiment, um, we need to know a couple of facts about uh, fractional quantum Hall systems, which are not too complicated. Um, the first is that fractional quantum Hall systems have edges. That's maybe obvious. I drew edges over there. Oh my God. Oh. Am I getting weaker or are these boards getting heavier? Um, okay. um, so one, they have edges. Um, so that's edges. What's the properties of the edges? So let's imagine here's the electrons inside the sample and then outside the sample is, is vacuum, okay? Just space. Um, two dimensional sample with, with, uh, with electrons. There's a magnetic field passing through the plane of the board. And I know there's an electric field pointing in this direction. Why do I know that? Well, if there were not an electric field, the electrons from the sample would leak out into, into space and they don't leak out. So I know there's an electric field holding them in. Good, happy, okay, good. Now we know from our elementary e &M, probably first year, e &M or a mechanics course, that when you have crossed E and B fields, you have a drift velocity, E cross B drift. Hopefully that sounds familiar. So the drift will be in this direction. And um, if you make a little bump of charge on the edge, that bump of charge will move along the edge with some velocity. Those bumps of charge come in units of E over three, okay? So we're going to use those um, little, this, this property to manipulate our uh, charges and send them around the system and move them around each other. So that's point one. Point two, I don't know, this, this, is, this is an engineering uh, statement that you can take your quantum Hall system and you can, so they are, here are the electrons in your two-dimensional plane and you can squeeze the system down um, from both sides uh, until there's sort of a narrow neck here. Um, 
just changing the, state, the shape of your sample. Okay, this is called a, a quantum point contact, a QPI, quantum point contact. Really, it's, it's, it should be just called a point contact, but they add the word quantum to make it sound cool. Um, so, so what happens when you have a quantum point contact? You have a little bump of charge that's running along the edge. It's going along the edge. And when it comes to the point contact, there's some amplitude for it to keep going on its way. And there's some amplitude for it to jump across the narrow neck and come back, okay? This is basically a half silvered mirror. So this is, we're going to be able to use this point contact like a mirror in optics, okay? So what we then do is we want to build an interferometer with these mirrors. And the way we're gonna do it is like this. So this experiment or a version of this experiment, well, okay, the earliest version of the experiment was from 1990 by Steve Kivelson, but then uh, the version that's most known is um, by a group, uh, Claudio Shimon, Denise Fried, Shivaji Sandhi, who's now the Wickham chair at Oxford, um, Xiaogan Wen, and one other person, I'm blanking on the name right now, so I apologize to that person. I can't, Steve Kibbleson, last one. Okay, anyway. Um, so we have the electrons in this, in these regions here, and we are going to uh, imagine a charge coming along the edge, uh, and then it comes to this half silver mirror, and there's some amplitude that it goes along its way, and there's some amplitude that it gets um, scattered back. So we're splitting it into two partial waves. So we'll give the partial wave here an amplitude T1. Um, then this wave here that will have some amplitude of getting scattered back here, and we'll give that an amplitude T2, then it continues on its way and interferes with the other partial wave, okay? If you've done optics, you will recognize this as being a fabry perot interferometer. Um, so you're seeing the interference of two partial waves reflected back um, at, different, at different places. Um, so the amount, so the wave function coming back is going to be uh, T1 plus T2 times e to the i phi, where phi is the phase that you accumulate going around this loop. Okay, good. And so the total current back, current backscattering that you measure in the experiment, which you, all you can measure easily is, is currents and voltages in this experiment, is going to be the square of the wave function coming back, which is then T1 squared, let's assume T is real, plus T2 squared, plus two T1, T2, cosine, cosine phi. And the thing we're going to pay attention to is that cosine phi. Okay, I'm gonna to try to figure out um, something from that, that cosine phi. We wanna know what, what's going to change that phase. Okay, how can we change that phase? Well, one thing we can do uh, to change phase, uh, change phase, how do we do it? Three ways to do it. First is change the length. This is what's done in fabry perot interferometer. You change the length of this, of this cavity, so it's, you need more wavelengths to go around the cavity, and so phi changes, okay? Now, how do you actually do it in an experiment? It's very hard to change the positions of these quantum point contacts, but what you can do pretty easily, you take this edge, and you think of this as, as water on a beach. You know, there's some slope on the beach, and the, the water comes up to some level on the beach. What you can do is you can put a, a little voltage uh, up from the edge over here and make a little bit of a hill to force the electrons to go around that hill such that they have to take a longer path, okay? So, so you can sort of add a little bit of sand on the beach and then the, the water has to take a little detour. And if you ask how long is the coastline, the coastline changes its length. Clear? Okay, good. So we can change the length. And if we do that, we plot um, the current backscattered as a function of length. And sure enough, you see constructive and destructive interference as this phase phi changes. Good? Good. All right. The second thing we can, we can change. Oh my God. 
I think engineers are stronger than physicists. Yeah, okay. Two, we can change the magnetic field, change B. Now to explain what this does, I have to um, tell you about one thing that you may not have heard about, which is that if you take a charge uh, Q around a magnetic flux, B, you accumulate a phase, phase EB, um, made dimensionless appropriately. This is what's known as a higher enough Bohm effect. No, Bohm. And it is another example of Stiegler's law. A higher enough Bohm wrote about this in 59, but it was actually discovered by Ehrenberg and Sidde um, 10 years earlier, uh, 49. Um, so it's actually quite an interesting effect because the charge never has to touch the magnetic field and yet it accumulates a phase dependent on the magnetic field. So that was considered to be very interesting by Harnoff and Bohm, but it was known to Ehrenberg and Sidde. Ehrenberg was a, a very great microscoper. He was interested in, in microscopy and electron microscopy, and he was interested in what is the effect of a magnetic field on his electron microscope. And he realized that electron waves would be deflected in a certain way by the magnetic field, even if they didn't touch the magnetic field. Ehrenberg actually comes into hi important history in, in other ways. People probably know the story of, of Rosalind Franklin, the X-ray crystallographer who took data on, on, on DNA and her data was stolen by, um, by Watson and Crick who then deduced the structure of, of DNA and got a Nobel prize for it. Although, I mean, it sounds like the usual case where the person who did the work doesn't get the Nobel prize, but to be fair, by the time they got the Nobel Prize, Rosalind Franklin was dead because she, she died in credit. I think she was like only 38 or something. She was very, very young uh, from cancer. So um, he, probably she would have been included if she had still been alive, but we don't really remember her name uh, along with the others. Well, okay, maybe we didn't now do, but anyway, everyone should remember her name. And so why is Ehrenberg important to this? So Ehrenberg um, had worked with her and had built a special purpose x-ray device for her to use for exactly this experiment. So that's um, how he's important in this story. Anyway, um, that's sort of a, another tangent. So I have a tendency to go off on those, I apologize. So we can do the same experiment here. We're going to um, now change the magnetic field, change the magnetic field. And again, you see oscillations as you get constructive and destructive interference, depending on the magnetic field going through the going through the, the loop. The third thing that we can do, the thing that we're interested in, three, um, we would like to add a quasi-particle inside the loop. Why does that make a difference? Well, because of exactly this. If one quasi-particle goes around the loop and another quasi-particle is inside the loop, that's like if I draw a space-time diagram, T going up like this, that's one particle staying still and another particle going around the other particle like this. That's two exchanges. That's the same as you know, doing this and then doing this. So it's two exchanges. So you should pick up a phase of e to the four pi i over three for doing that, exchange twice. Everyone happy with that? Um, so we'd like to see um, that we pay, when you add a quasi-particle into the loop, you um, uh, actually pick up that, that fractional phase. So what the data actually looks like is they plot um, on one axis, the magnetic field, on the other axis, we plot the length. And then I'm, what I'm gonna draw here is the position of the maxima of these oscillations, okay? So the position of the maxima of the oscillations looks kind of like this. Okay, so it's periodic in both magnetic field and it's periodic in length with different periodicities. But then every once in a while, you see a glitch and the registry of this periodicity shifts. And this distance here is exactly one third of this distance here. Okay, and then you'll see another shift, okay? And so what's happening here is at any given uh, length in the magnetic field, there is some 
number of quasi-particles that want to sit in the middle of that, of that device. I should also mention the device has to be a few microns or smaller in size because otherwise you don't see any interference at all. You just, you know, you sort of, everything is lost. Um, there is some number of quasi-particles that you, um, that sit inside that device, but the energetics and the charges are slowly changing as you change the length from the magnetic field um, to, uh, in the system. And so at some point in this length of magnetic field diagram, that number, which was the best number to have inside that dot, will shift by one and a particle will jump in, okay? So depending on what the, what, what's, the, what's the ground state at that length and magnetic field, the, the number of quasi-particles in the loop will change by one and the, and the interference pattern shifts over by, by about a third. And so it's a very clear and direct uh, experimental observation of this fractional braiding phase. Now, I, I, I think I've run out of time, so I, I should stop there. I could say a couple more words if people wanted to about why this experiment took 20 years or more to do, or 40 years to do. Um, but maybe I should um, leave some time for other questions because people might have them or, or people have gotten tired and need would prefer to sleep at this point. So anyway, I'll thank you for your attention and take any questions that you guys might have. Oops. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, yeah we opened the questions. Unfortunately, we don't have the going mic thing that we had in the credential department, but you can just speak up and we probably use it there. Uh, thank you for the lecture. It was like, extremely interesting and really well presented. Thank you. Uh, there's a bit of a matter of question here after like, what would be the last statistics that this particle would have? Like, this also kind of breaks down the very natural analogy that we have like impermeance and bones and people where there's only two types, introverts and extroverts. And okay, now we have also this third type. So, what kind of person would be the annual speed? How many would like together? Oh, oh, so that's a, that's actually a, it's a good question. That yeah, so so that you have introverts and extroverts. I'm not sure which we call the, but that the, there's you know actually the other experiment which I didn't talk talk about um, actually tries to probe that more that question. So so the question is you have introverts and extroverts, those that like to bunch and those that don't like to bunch. The bosons like to bunch together, and the fermions like to stay stay apart from each other. And what will the anions do? So there's a, a long so there's a long history of people doing these experiments and with photons and showing that photons like to bunch together. So the, the classic experiment of, of this sort of this sort is a so-called Hanbury Brown twist experiment done in the 1950s. Hanbury Brown is one person and twist is another. I understand, I mean, there's a lot of things about British culture that I don't completely understand, even though I've been here for a while. Um, but I understand that a unhyphenated double barrel last, last name is considered to be posh. I don't know why, but apparently it is. And Hanbury Brown is an unhyphenated double barrel last name. So he was one person and apparently was very posh and Twist is another person. Anyway, the Hanbury Brown and Twist experiment is an experiment which show, uh, can actually basically show you uh, roughly what the experiment is. You send light into a, uh, into a uh, half silver mirror like this, and some of it goes through and some of it comes out um, uh, reflected. And you measure the correlate, you know, how much light comes out here and how much light comes out here and when it comes out. And what you discover from, from noise measurements is that when you have a bunch of um, photons hitting this at the same time, they tend to go in the same direction, not, in, in op not randomly, okay? Because bosons have a tendency to bunch. You can do the same experiment in, with quantum Hall effect with fermions, with integer quantum Hall effect, where you don't, you, nothing's fractionalized into E over three, it's just E. Um, and you do the same experiment is the opposite. The, 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 the fermions um, anti-bunch, they will come out at the opposite ones instead of the same one. Then the anions do something in between. So they don't bunch as much as the 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 bosons and they don't anti bunch as much as the fermions and so it's so it is something in between and it has been that is is what the other experiment what the anion collider experiment was aiming to to measure it's a little you have to do some interpretation of exactly how you how you interpret bunching or anti bunching from noise which is a little more complicated and strictly speaking 
you would say that, that this is actually not measuring statistics directly, but um, measuring exclusion or bunching behavior more directly. So it's, it's a bit of a different, different beast, but it's, also, it's a, also a very beautiful experiment. It was also something that took a very long time to figure out how to do. Okay, yeah. Other questions in there, yeah. Is there a good reason why the phase is a nice fraction of two pi? Yeah, um, that's a, it's a good point. Um, so yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a good reason. In fact, it's basically a, a holy statement that it has to be a rational fraction. And it also must be re related to um, that P over Q ratio sitting, sitting up there. Um, there are microscopic theories of quantum Hall effect that will tell you that when the denominator gets bigger, the stability of the fraction goes down. That, um, that if, you, if you looked at something with, um, you know, I don't know, a new equals four over 15 or something, because the 15 is large, the, uh, you would only see this at a much, much lower temperature than you would see for uh, one over three. Okay, so that's why, um, and then the relation of that denominator to the phase, they, those, come, those are, are related as well, is why it's a nice, nice fraction. Yeah, well, there was, okay, one, two, and three. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question also. Um, there is not a free field, there's not a simple free field representation of, of anions. So you, you might try to cook up something, you know, if you're doing quantum field theory, you say, okay, you're, your, your boson fields are, are, have commutation relations with, you know, you can say something about the commutator and the fermionic fields, you can say something about the anti-commutator, but for, for anions, there's no, no such simple construction. Um, there are ways to represent anions in field theories, but they're not based on free fields. Thank you. Yeah, welcome, it's a good question. Um, there was, okay, there was others, but I've forgotten who I said was next. So I'm so there. Yeah, no, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, as the question similar to that, can you approach a, uh, a space? Uh, yes, you can, and it's fractional. This was in fact what uh, I raised and what Will Check was interested in, 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 in that 1982 paper. If you had particles with a fractional spin, what would be their exchange statistic? There's still a spin statistics theorem. Um, you know, everyone, and Surprised that spin statistics theorems hold even in um, non Lorentz invariant systems. Lorentz invariance is not required for spin statistics here, uh, spin, spin statistics to, to hold, although it is, is sufficient but not necessary. You still have spin statistics in these anion systems as well. So it's some fractional uh, spin as well. Yes. Uh, has there been any research into higher dimensions? Like, I'm trying to think of, let's say, the four plus one dimensions. Yeah. There is something at least partially over the so, Yeah. So that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question also. Yes, there has been research into, into this. So in, um, surprisingly, I mean, people are interested in four plus one and five plus one and so forth for, for lots of fundamental reasons. And, and, and surprisingly, uh, even condensed matter physicists who are very grounded in things that you can actually make in a laboratory do think about four plus one because often by doing this, you learn more about, about systems in three plus one. Um, so if you go back to the three plus one question, there are caveats associated with the statement that there's nothing but bosons and fermions. So for example, if the elementary particle excitations are no longer required to be points, if you can have string-like excitations, then you can have exotic statistics in, in three dimensions. But in all higher dimensions, the same rule that you can you only get bosons and fermions as point particles still holds. Yeah. Because the same thing, you can always, you know, exchange squared is always going to be the identity for exactly the same reason in, in higher dimensions than in three and higher dimensions. But then you can start asking about exchanging of, of strings and, and exchanging of membranes and things like that. And you can get all sorts of very complicated things. There's been a lot of progress on understanding those in, in, so in recent years. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, this is all described by topological quantum field theories and, and you, know, uh, you know, mathematicians, category theorists like to think about this in all dimensions and, and you know, a lot, most 
almost everything is known in two plus one dimensions as to what, what can happen. In three plus one dimensions, it's still, there's, there's a lot that's not completely established, although we're starting to believe that we know a lot of the, the answers. Um, in four plus one, I think we, we, know, we know less even. Um, there's some variance on this where there's still a lot of research questions if you, uh, particularly cases where you enforce additional symmetries on the system, time reversal symmetry or something might, that would, that changes the story as to what, what you can get, um, crystalline symmetry. Um, so there's still a lot of research going on as to what, what kind of particles you can get. Thank you. Yeah. Other, is there something, something else? Yes. Um, you talked about class of particles that, that, uh, appear within, uh, the loop. Um, do they also interact with each other? They do. They're they're charged. They have charge e over three, and it's um, that charge is to a large extent the thing that's um, you know you know charge neutrality is very powerful. Um, but as you're changing, um, you know the way you're uh, the way you're changing the length of the edge is by putting a voltage on the edge, and so the quasi particles you know the potential felt by the quasi particles in the center is going to change a little bit as you change the the length of the edge and 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 this is what's going to change the the optimal number of the quasi particles inside in fact the fact that they so this was one of the reasons why why this experiment took 15 years longer to do than um than it was originally thought it is because these particles are, are are charged you know ideally you want you want to have the you know the particles an ideal anion with no charge just sits there happily doesn't ruin anything else but in fact um one of the things that that people discovered unfortunately is um well okay there's a lot of confusion around the year 2000 to 2010 um and it, the problem was that when a quasi particle sat in the middle it interacted so strongly with the with the particles running along the edge that it you couldn't see any signal at all or no no sensible signal at any rate like there's a sort of a long story about uh how that was worked out eventually and it was even conjectured that it was actually fundamentally impossible to do this experiment that no one would ever be able to do the experiment you know from fundamental reasons that you, because of this coulomb charge but the way that it was conquered was a very clever solution and and it's it's not a coincidence that the person who did this experiment was is a person who does the experiments himself but is also a materials grower that he does the molecular beam epitaxy so molecular beam epitaxy is the art of growing uh semiconductor crystals atomic layer by atomic layer it's a very hard thing to do you have to um you know you you you're working in an environment with the pressure is has to be taken down to about 10 to the minus 15 atmosphere to get rid of all possible disorders or impurities. Um, that's a rather impressive vacuum. It's a better vacuum than outer space. Um, so you have to get into that, you know, this mode, and then you can grow your samples one atomic layer at a time. And what he did was he constructed a sample which um, looks. Uh, okay. So you you have your, your two-dimensional electron layer here. Uh, this is the, where you're gonna be doing the experiment, your two-dimensional electrons. And basically you have on both sides of it, you have additional electron layers. And the point of this is that when you, if you get a charge here, you get image charges he, uh, here. And that means that two of these um, particles, which are nearby, interact much, much less strongly than they would be if they were if they didn't have image charges and this enabled them to basically get rid of the interaction between or to a large extent get rid of the interaction between the center of the dot and the edges and enabled the experiment to work it was it was you know a, a brilliant uh scheme for doing this and and it was something that people didn't believe was going to be possible i mean this is i mean doing this is is it sounds like an easy trick but it's actually not an easy trick because trying to get a um electron gas in the middle that's sufficiently clean and perfect uh, in order to see quantum Hall effect in the first place uh, is, is quite an, an art form to begin with. And it's, you know, there's people had over the course of, you know, 20 or 30 years, they had developed a particular design of exactly how do you do this growth? 
you know, how do you grow layer by layer? What do you put on in each layer in order that when you make this two-dimensional electron gas, it's pristine and has very, very high mobility with no impurities whatsoever. And adding these two layers nearby, you know, anything could have happened. It could have gone completely wrong. So they had to do a lot of optimization and, and redeveloping of, of 20 some years of, of, of art that had been, had been developed previously. Other questions? You talked about horses and anti-horses. Did the anti-equivalent Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. Um, so I'm actually not sure even which one uh, was done in the experiment. That they have charged this plus or minus e over three, but I, I don't even remember which one. They're very, they're really symmetric to each other. They're very very much uh, symmetric. So it's it's one direction, not the other. I'm not sure. I mean, maybe it was one on the outside and another one on the inside. They they um. You know they, they um, they're fairly interchangeable. So thank you. You're welcome. Any any other ones? Yeah. Oh yeah, I didn't tell you that. Um, so um, it's kind of like like in a uh, it's kind of similar to a um, in in water. And when you have a vortex in water, it actually pushes the water out as well. And it leaves an absence of, of the water in the center. Um, it's not a great argument, but I mean, you have to go sort of through the details a little bit, but there is a, there's a strict relationship between charge and vorticity in the, in the fractional quantum Hall effect. So I didn't explain that. You're right. Yeah. Yes, it can. So um, they they can annihilate, um, and they do. There's a net charge conservation. So typically, you know, you the um, there's some net charge in in the system, and you'll have some leftover charge, and those will be those vortices. So you, you know, there'll there'll be you know some density of these things hanging around. And everything else annihilates. Yeah, it will be either either all vortices basically or all anti vortices hanging around, and in in the bulk. You're welcome. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's a good question. So the um. I'm not sure this is going to be a helpful answer. It's a Berry's phase calculation. If you've run into Berry's phase, if you've not run into Berry's phase, it's not it. But basically, um, if you run into um, adiabatic approximation, that you know that the um, if you have a Hamiltonian, which is a function of time, and you change it slowly, um, the eigenstates track the you know the instantaneous eigenstate. You know, sort of sits in the instantaneous eigenstate. However, there's a correction to that statement. So Berry's phase is the correction to that statement that if you just track the instantaneous eigenstate, you miss the, that there's an additional phase that you, you pick up, which is basically if, if you sort of ask, what did I do wrong in, um, in adiabatic approximation? You know, and if you do it very, very slowly and you add it up over, you know, there's, there's a very small correction that you have to add up all the way around the loop. And that's basically what um, what what accumulates to this phase. So it's a correct it's a correction to adiabatic approximation. It can be done very explicitly in this case. Other questions or comments? So Michael Berry is um, a rather um, a senior professor at 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 Bristol, and many people have. Um, have said that he, for Barry's face, he should also be awarded a Nobel Prize, along with a Harnoff. Um, here, it's often he's put together with a Harnoff, who's still alive. As um, but Harnoff, I think probably won't get it because of Ehrenberg and Sidde, and Barry may not get it because there's a precedent before him as well. Um, so I think I, I don't know. I've been wrong before. Sometimes they they do it anyway. But but I think uh, despite the fact that what you know his rediscovery of Berry's phase is very important. He, he wasn't necessarily the first person there. But he did get named after him, so. 
Anything else? Yeah. Uh, can these ions interact with like uh, a boson? They can, yeah. Um, so for example, you can have, uh, the, the anions stay in a plane. Um, you can have the anions uh, bump into phonons, for example, and uh, you know, lattice vibrations, which, which are bosons. They can, the anions can actually bump into individual electrons as well. But the, the electrons that are um, making up the ground state are invisible to the, to the anions, but you could add an additional electron and try bumping your anion into that or muon or something like that. You can bump your, your anion into that in principle as well. Yeah, another one. Sorry, this has been on before. Did your anions have spin? They did. It was just, it was just asked. Yeah. That, yeah, right, right there. Yeah, and anions have fractional spin as well as, as uh, fractional phase. The spin statistics theorem holds that the, the phase that you get for exchanging two identical particles is always the same as the phase you get for rotating a spin around by, by 2 pi. Yeah. But that phase doesn't be almost in the chemical representation. It, it is, well, it's here you're in, in two dimensions. So you have to think about um, uh, not representations of SU2 anymore because you don't rotate in, in all, all three directions. You only rotate in, in, in two dimensions. So that's like a possible... Is it what? So is that like a possible representation? Yeah, in, in two dimensions it is. Is that's allowed, not in three dimensions. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Thank you so much for uh, the talk as well. I'll ask you a lot of questions. Um, it was really, really interesting, and I really, really enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody else enjoyed it as well. Thank you.